My dear brothers and sisters, good evening and welcome to Sunday Night Prime. My name is Brother Angelus along with Father Innocent, and uh, we are at Franciscan Friars of the Renewal filling in for Father Andrew Apostoli this evening. It has been a while since we have been on <laughs> Sunday Night Prime. It's great to be here and we truly sit in the chairs of legends. We remember right now Father Benedict Rochelle, who God rest in peace and and uh, he was such a spiritual father to us and especially in the media. And so we think of him tonight and Father Apostoli who's away. but. I'm just excited to be here to, to evangelize through media. We want to thank, quick, take a quick moment and thank everybody. We had, have had a great couple months with the debut of Icon Spotlight on EWTN, and, and now we're jumping over to Sunday Night Prime. We don't want to confuse everyone, but it's all in the family. <laughs> um, and we're just so excited to be, to be with you tonight on Sunday Night Prime. And to, Father Innocent, we have a great conversation uh, tonight, and we're, we're really excited to dive deeper into the aspect of freedom, liberty, but also maybe at the heart of it, the moral life. And it's interesting in our culture, I think there's a lot of confusion, and we'll talk about this. It's um, even within the church sometimes, even a, a lot of with kind of the younger generation, kind of our generation, um, we, we misunderstand what it means to, to live in freedom, what it means to live a moral life that's free, to choose the good, uh, what it means to, uh, to be free in Christ, and knowing that freedom is a, a part of a relationship. And so we're going to talk about this and with all the context, the culture, the, the, the country we, we live in. Um, and and it's, it's going to be an exciting conversation. My brothers and sisters, we are excited to welcome uh, someone to the show that knows a lot about freedom. And um, <laughs> he does, uh, makes a tremendous impact in the church and the world. And uh, he's a Dominican, <laughs> so we love Dominicans. Uh, Father Wojciech Gertek, uh, welcome to the show. Father oh is God. the theologian to the papal household, whole household, excuse me, and he is a moral theologian, teaches moral theology at the Angelicum in Rome. Father, thank you so much for being with us this thank evening. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. We, we, we don't want our Franciscan-Dominican <laughs> rivalry to come up here, but we're well, just... a little bit. A little bit, bit. bit. is always <laughs> good. Um, we're just so grateful, Father, to, to have you here and um, again sitting with... Uh, Father Benedict and Father Andrew are really at the heart of the conversation in America about culture and about what it means to live in the truth, what it means to live uh, their faith and, and encouraging the audience here at EWTN and, and the younger generation to be men and women of faith, men and women of truth, and men and women of freedom. They might not say it like that, but this is, this is what we're excited to talk to you about today. Father, before we get started, um, we would love just to, to hear a little bit about your life. Um, you were born in uh, London, but you are of Polish descent, and uh, you, you weren't born the papal household uh, no. theologian. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, uh, and maybe at the heart of your Dominican vocation as well, um, tell us a little bit about uh, what the Lord has done in your, in your life in the past. I was born in England of Polish parents. Um, the first Dominican that I saw I don't remember seeing him, but he remembered it, and that was Father Yves Congar, oh, wow. who was who imprisoned during the war with my father. And when I visited him already as a Dominican, as a priest, uh, he immediately gave the address of our house in London, and he said in the 1950s he visited our house, and there were some babies on the floor. Well, I was one of them. <laughs> so I think that maybe he had a said a prayer for my Dominican vocation and then. Look at you now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but anyway, uh, I was born and raised in a Polish family in London, but then I went to Poland still under the communist period uh, because I wanted to see the real Poland, the present day Poland, and not the Poland of my parents, which was pre-war. And I studied history in Poland. I got to know the Dominicans. I discovered my vocation and I entered the order in Poland. So I was a student brother in Krakow when the local bishop was a certain Karol Wojtyla. I was there when We've he was elected. Pope. <laughs> <laughs> I was elected. Uh, I was there when he was elected pope. Oh wow! And then after ordination, I was sent for further studies to Rome. And for many years, I worked in Krakow, dealing in formation, but preaching, teaching, moral theology. And and then I was called to Rome to teach in Rome. Then I was called to be the assistant of our general. 
for Central and Eastern Europe. So I traveled around Eastern when the boundaries crashed, when the Soviet Union crashed, the boundaries were open. So I, I was a witness of the rebirth of the order and of the wow. church mm. in the post-Soviet world, the Czechoslovakia and Hungary and so on. So this was my task to make the contacts between the Dominicans who were appearing from underground and the new men there, the establishment of communities and the master of the order. We call him the master, our general. And then I was made the assistant for studies. So I was traveling around the world visiting Dominican centers of studies. Then I was hoping to go back to, to go to Ukraine to help the brethren there. But Pope Benedict messed up my plans <laughs> and arrested me in the Vatican. <laughs> arrested you <laughs> and now I'm living as a hermit in the Vatican <laughs> as the papal theologian. And this is a very prestigious position. I was terrified when I was appointed, <laughs> particularly under a pope called Ratzinger, you know, with, <laughs> yeah. with the enormous amount of books that he's written. But this is a position which dates from the time of St. Dominic. So I have a whole list of predecessors, all Dominicans. And the most important task is to read the texts which are prepared for the Pope. Huh? It's the experience of the Holy See that it's good to have a Dominican who should know something about Thomas Aquinas, to have somebody at hand. And yeah. so the various discourses which are prepared for the Pope, huh? before the Pope gets them, I read them and I have to ensure that there's, there's nothing vague, there's nothing unclear there. But of course the Pope is free to to say what he wants so he doesn't have to follow my suggestions, <laughs> but it's a part of the procedure of the speech writers of preparing the text for the Pope, that, and that's the reason why I'm there. But occasionally I do sneak out. Do sneak out. <laughs> and like Hence in, being in the, in, summer, in, you in know, the United so, States right now. So I came <laughs> to preach a retreat in, in America, and so I'm Wonderful. here. Wonderful. Well, I was just going to follow up with just a little a small follow-up question to that, Father. Um, that you, you speak of it as a very important work, this, 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 the gift of being a theologi uh, theologian to the papal household. What is it, what has that role um, spiritually um, done, like it taught you. Um, you know, I, you're a priest. You've been a priest for how many years? Uh, I was ordained in 1981. Huh? So <laughs> do the math. <laughs> <laughs> but what is that? What has that taught you to be to have that role? Because it's not just a functional role. Yeah. But spiritually, what has that taught you? Well, it were, as I said, I was a bit terrified at the beginning, and there was also a change. All my life, I lived in a first in a large family and then in a community, and then I had to live as a hermit alone in the Vatican. But a Dominican friend of mine from the United States said that the Dominican should study, should read, should think, and should should produce books. Now, in my province in Poland, this is difficult because all our priories are very pastoral, with full churches, with liturgies, with confessions, with preaching. So if you want to study, it's a sort of almost a private hobby. <laughs> yeah, sure. Whereas, by the grace of God, I'm given the conditions. I live in the Vatican, I have an apartment there, and I have my books, and I go out to teach to the Angelicum. But it, this has allowed me to, to, to rethink many things, to clarify my thinking. I produced a few books in Polish. I write in Polish, which is my mother tongue. And uh, so, as you asked me, spiritually, it, be, it has been a stage of my life uh, that I am now at this stage doing this work, and I have to accept it, and, and somehow God has some plans for me. Uh, <laughs> Of course, the Pope may dismiss me at any moment, <laughs> and the, the, the position sure. is such, but now I've learned to love the time that I have for Beautiful. reading, for studying, and, and for prayer, and so on, and putting things together in my mind, which is ultimately for the service of the That's church. Right. Amen. And this is, in some sense, more important than the actual reading of the text, which was prepared for the Pope for the Angelus Discourse, where, yeah. Yeah. where there's not much there to correct. Yeah. <laughs> and basically, those who are writing these texts are all Catholics, and under the time of Benedict, they were doing a little bit of plagiarism because they were pulling out the ideas of a certain Josef Ratzinger and sneaking <laughs> them into the text of Pope sure. Benedict. Uh, Father, we're very excited tonight to invite our audience in on EWTN to this uh, an all-important conversation, as we talked about before the show. The, this conversation is happening within the context of a broader conversation in, in our country here in the United States, but also in the world about the moral life, about freedom. Uh, we, we're in the midst of an election, so people throw that word around a lot. Maybe it uh, would be helpful for our audience. We, we think it's interesting. I, I, 
I'm fascinated by the, the idea, the history of your position, the fact that the, the Holy Fathers would want to keep Dominicans and, and mm -hmm. Thomistic philosophy and theology close to, mm -hmm. to the papal household, to what the, what the Pope preaches, etc. We, I'm still in seminary, and, and Father Innocent is just not a, Brother just Innocent. A little guy. Yeah, Father Innocent <laughs> is not Brother Innocent anymore. He was just ordained. And, uh, but we, in our seminary here in New York, but also we're being from Nebraska, hear a lot about Thomistic thought. Um, seminaries, as they should, take great pride in the fact of being Thomistic based. Could you give our audience an understanding of, of what, we mean, what we mean by that when we say um, Thomistic philosophy, Thomistic theology? Well, basically, uh, what is important is theology, and theology is a reflection on the truth, uh, on the truth that has been revealed. Uh, Christ is the Word of God, uh, and so we reflect on, on that Word, and we can make a distinction between speculative theology and positive theology. Positive theology studies what has been laid out, positum in Latin, and so the history of uh, salvation, how through various terms, various languages, Hebrew, Greek, uh, God has revealed the truths through a long process, and then how in the history of the church, these truths have been studied and viewed in the light of the culture of Syriac, Greek, uh, uh, Roman, medieval, Renaissance, modern culture. And this is a type of theological reflection that Pope Benedict likes very much. And so in his works, he tried to respond to the type of questions that appear in the minds of German uh, sure. thinkers and so on. <laughs> Whereas Aquinas dealt with speculative theology, which tries to grasp the truth in a simple definition. So it's not a theology which is sort of focused on the resistances that people have in their minds, but of grasping the truth in a, in a sort of catechism definition, to know exactly what is involved. Now we need, and, and philosophy helps in this, in the, in the furnishing of tools and precise thinking and the metaphysical perception of reality. But this is used so as to explicate, to make clearer what God has revealed. Huh? What are the truths that God has given us, which are life-giving, which are salvific. And it's important that we not only are moved, uh, that we are attracted, huh? but that we have, that we have clear, a clear understanding, because then we can have convictions. And when you can have convictions, you can decide about your life. In the American language, there's a slip that often people ask people, what are politicians, you know, what is your opinion on such and such a subject? And he answers, well, I feel that. Huh? Well, we're not interested in your feelings. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> or sometimes they say, well, I believe. Well, uh, faith is a gift of grace, uh, but there's also a natural faith. So if you believe that such a policy works, well, that's a personal subjective presentation of who you are. But this is not what we're interested. We're interested in the truth, you know, what is the heart of the matter. So if you ask your president what is his policy on a particular thing, you want to know his answer and not his feelings or his beliefs but his convictions, and it's the same in faith, eh? mm. that ultimately we need to have a structure of thinking within faith, eh? which is serious, which has an impact on our moral life, on our culture, on our social life, on politics, on everything, that, uh, uh, and ultimately on our journey towards heaven, which is the most important thing. Eh? Amen, and now more than ever, I, I think we need that clarity, yeah. and that's what's lacking, and especially we kind of, um, not to, talk about the age gap here, but young people need more than ever this clarity, this clarity of thinking. And, exactly. and we, we, have, we travel the world and talk to young people and truth is not a given. Yeah. You know, what, yeah. we, what we like, truth is just something that people are like trying to find, like, oh, I'm trying to find my truth. I'm trying to find like yeah. the, the spiritual, but not religious or the religious, but not spiritual, whatever that whole thing is. But truth is not clear. Truth is yeah. vague. Yeah. And this is dangerous. Well, we're living in a confused world, and I think certainly in Europe we're seeing this. It's a bit like Europe at the time of the crashing of the Roman Empire, and the barbarians were coming, and, and uh, people were confused. And the ancient Romans were seeing that there is a magnum delirium, that everybody's fighting everybody, and nobody knew why, <laughs> what were the issues. Uh, uh, and then St. Benedict responded by establishing his monasteries, his, his rule, his way of life, of focusing on what is most important. Huh? And, and so it's something similar today that we're living in a confused world, and this is a great service of the church and of classical uh, speculative theology 
of giving clear principles that you can build on them. You can understand, you know, where you stand. But they have to be within faith. It's not outside faith. It's a reflection within faith which allows us to structure our faith in our minds, in our hearts, in the decision making, in our lives. Wow. <laughs> You know, and that, and that uh, brings, that's a great way to bring to, get to, to the end our first segment. Um, again, we're here with Father Wojciech Giertek uh, of the Dominicans, the theologian to the papal household, uh, moral theo theolo theology professor at the Angelicum in Rome. Uh, we're sitting as Franciscans, just taking all just taking in, in all of the, <laughs> the, the Dominican theology. We're so grateful for your presence, Father. Thank you, thank we've got to take a quick break, but we have much more to talk about. We'll be right back. Dear friends, welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. Again, filling in for Father Andrew Apostoli is myself, Brother Angelus, and Father Innocent. Father Innocent, we're so honored and excited to be with you tonight. The, the topic for tonight is freedom. We're here with Father Wojciech Giertek. You're getting good at saying I, that. I, I'm good at saying that. I had to apologize many times practicing his name. Well, between segments, he's practicing it. Practicing out loud. <laughs> Father is the theologian to the papal household and, and moral theology professor at the Angelicum in Rome. And we're so excited he's here in the United States. He's giving retreats and doing many things. Uh, for the church, supporting the church here, Father. Thanks again for being Thank with you. us. I'm excited to get uh, dive a little <clears throat> deeper in, Father. Again, to our audience uh, today, the the topic is the really at the heart of what freedom is um, in the church, freedom in Christ, freedom freedom in our country, and uh, it's something that's often confused. But we have a guy who knows a lot about it here to to, to lead us through this, Father. I, I kind of pointed to it out in the first section, but freedom is really. And morality is really based in Christ. It's based in grace. It's, it's Christ alive in our soul that gives us the opportunity to experience really salvation. Um, and they, what, what could be a, a possible really foundational understanding for our audience is, is the theological understanding of liberty, a theological understanding of the moral life. Mm. Uh, how do we remind ourselves that we, we don't need to get caught up in the confusion of, of what freedom is, but also ultimately salvation. Well, uh, I'll go back uh, around Vatican II, when the council was called, the, the council has responded to issues which were problematic in the first part of the, 19th cent uh, of the 20th century, questions of ecclesiology, of ecumenism, of biblical theology and so on. Whereas the, uh, the council hasn't really responded in, uh, in extensively about how do we understand Christian morals. And now the basic crisis in the world concerns morals. Nobody cares really so much about uh, the relationship between biblical archaeology and, and scripture <laughs> yeah. and so on. These are issues which are not dramatic, but how to explain, how to present Christian morals. And this is an issue which the Council has given us the intuition that it has to be through Christ, that Christ is in the center. And Christ is fully divine and fully human, with a human heart he, he loved, with a human mind he fought, with human hands he worked. Yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, this is, uh, and uh, the church in the world uh, is viewed primarily through the conscience of individuals. Who are, who are moved by grace. Huh? So I think this is the most dramatic issue which the church is confronting with the world. Huh? How to present the moral teaching. Now it's not a question that in the history of the church, you know, at some moment something was a sin, now it's no longer a sin, or something wasn't a sin and it's now, a, this is not even, uh, the development doesn't function in this way, but how do we ensure that we tie the, uh, the moral life with the fundamental truths of our faith? Huh? Now, I, uh, years back, found a line of St. Thomas Aquinas, which has helped me enormously, where he says there are three ways of being of God. God is everywhere, maintaining reality in existence. God is in a different way in the souls of the saints, and in a different way in uh, Christ, in the hypostatic union. Now, I see this as a key to read the major work of Aquinas, the Summa Theology. And the first part is about God, who's the creator, and, and about anthropology as we came out from the hands of God. 
the whole moral section is about the working of grace within the sanctified person, and the third part is about Christ and the sacraments. So moral theology is basically the explaining how the grace of God changes us from within. So it's more a question about what God does to us rather than what we do to God. That's beautiful. And Father, if I could just, it, it, it kind of shapes um, a, the personal relationship with Christ. It, it takes the emphasis off of what we do. I think often in, uh, in kind of the, the, the modern church, especially with young people, it's always like, well, it's always about do's and don'ts, rules, rules, yeah, right. rules, rules. And what you're saying is, is not that. Yeah. It's about relationship. Well, you can uh, uh, view morals either in the center you have acts. Is it a sin? Is it not a sin? Can <laughs> I do this? Can I not do? Or about laws, rules, procedures that you have to follow. Huh? Whereas the, uh, the, the really Catholic answer is in the center is grace. Grace which generates virtues, which develops our interior liberty and enables us to do the good. Aquinas has a line also, he says that he who avoids evil because of the divine precept is not free. Mm. Wow. He who avoids evil because it's evil, he is free. And we can reverse this and say, he who does the good because he was told to do it, is not free. free. He who does the good because it's good, is free. So the question is of, the, of forming the mind and the heart to perceive what is the true good and form the capacity to stick to it to do it to, uh, creatively in a responsible way. To and that's what the virtue is? Is that what and the that, habit and is, the habitus? And, and the virtue is a permanent capacity. We have natural acquired virtues for our effort that we can acquire. But from the moment of baptism, we receive the infused virtues, which the theological virtues which enable us to encounter God. And then they spill out on the moral life as we live out a personal relationship with God through faith, hope, and charity then the entire moral ethos, the entire moral life is transformed from within and we acquire this capacity to, to go for the true good uh, with facility, with speed, with pleasure and in a creative way. So it's not just one list of, uh, list of good <laughs> exactly. acts that we have to do, but we can go for the good using all our talents, using all the capacities that we have. And if we believe that the grace of God is already within us, uh, that we have it since baptism and when we're in the state of grace we have the supernatural power given to us which passes through our human faculties so through our, uh, our mind our will through our talents through our education through everything that we are but we can go for the good in such a way that something of the goodness of god becomes apparent here and now where god has put us and god is pleading for our minds and hearts to have something of the inner life of the Trinity mm. present where we happen to be standing now. And we need that. Like, we need that, like the face of Christ, the experience of grace and goodness in our lives, like a concrete experience. And that's what's beautiful. Like, if but we you, can live you are this. using the word experience, well, which I, is subjective. <laughs> which is focusing which I stand on our corrected. Own. I stand corrected. <laughs> I, I, we, the truth of that, the truth of, the, of what you're speaking of. A, a baptized baby has the virtues but doesn't feel them. Doesn't it? Yeah, sure. And so this <clears throat> is the issue that we often do not, we don't feel the life of grace. Uh, so it's not something that we can experience. Uh, <laughs> yes. And when we're feeling it, ah, oh, then God is close. And then the next yeah, time I'm exactly. not feeling anything, and I think God is absent. No, we need to believe that we have received the supernatural tools and we need to believe in the supernatural quality of the supernatural tools that we've And received. that's a reality. And that is a reality. Amen. And I like to compare them to uh, particularly faith to a computer program. You have to do something on your computer and someday you, don't know how to do it, you discover I already have the software in there but you didn't know it was in your computer and when you do it there's a moment of joy that <laughs> like, I can do it. It's there. It's there. It works. It works. Now the, the, the virtues that are infused by grace within us they are sometimes like a forgotten computer program yeah. but they enable us to encounter God, to bring in God into what we're doing. Huh? And then there is a supernatural fruitfulness in the work we do. And I often see this as a papal theologian. You know, <laughs> you know I'm a, I have to read the text prepared for the Pope, and I saw this under Benedict as well. I'm given the text for a, the, 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 the papal sermon or for the Angelus. Huh? I read it on my desk. 
It seems boring. It seems repetitive. <laughs> well, there's nothing. This is going to be this people, yeah, people <laughs> This is, you know, way. well, you know, it's correct, you know. Yeah, but, uh, and then I'm in the basilica, and the basilica is full of people, huh? They are at prayer, and the Pope is preaching, huh? And it's the text which I recognize, which I've read. Huh? But this moment of faith of all the faithful, and this is the vicar of Christ, huh? and it's not only just the text, but there's something supernatural which comes across. This text, which for me seemed boring on my desk. Oh, just a piece of paper. <laughs> a piece of paper. Now that is, it, it's carried by the power of God. Huh? Mm. Now we need, that. this we Dominicans call this the grace of preaching. Huh? That we, we need, need to that. bring I need that. We need that. We <laughs> Franciscans need, uh, need that, Father. Uh, we all need it. Uh, <laughs> married couples need, need it. Need it now, you know, of course. Of dealing course. With, with children, we need it. And if we believe in the power of our faith, huh? if you're talking to somebody, a difficult teenager at a difficult stage, if in that moment you make an act of faith in the presence of God in you and in the person whom you're talking to, you're inviting the Holy Spirit into that conversation and suddenly something comes across. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And so, and so this, is, this is essential huh? mm -hmm. to live out a life in a supernatural way and this transforms everything, including our liberty. Father, there's uh, to make a, a little bit of a transition um, now from theological to philosophical, um, it, it's important to define terms. We talked about in the earlier yeah. segment, the, the convictions yeah. and the clarity that is yeah. your job. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to ask you to use that here. It, with particular, uh, I know everything kind of falls under the moral life, but how do we define, uh, when we use this word a lot and overuse it, but freedom? What does it really, freedom really mean when we, well, when we use it in, in the philosophical and theological in sense? The, in the Western world, we often use the phrase reason and free will. We attach an adjective to the will and not to the reason. Now Aquinas doesn't do this. He writes about the reason and the will. And he doesn't, we don't say the, the reason is immediately wise. It's not wise. You need many years of formation before you acquire wisdom. <laughs> and the will, and Aquinas uses the term liberum arbitrum, which I translate as free choice. And he explains this as the joint action of the reason and the will together, and they mutually influence one another. Now, as we undertake acts in which we see the heart of the matter, we understand them. So the reason comes into it, and we are creative in what we are doing. Huh? Then, uh, then we are uh, growing in liberty, and the grace of God can work within our will. It's not an enemy of our will. And so as we choose the good, understanding the heart of the matter, and so the reason and the will are not functioning as often people thought in a sequential manner that the reason perceives, the conscience gives the judgment, and then the will follows, which means the whole responsibility falls on the will, and then there is a forcing yeah. of the will, it may end in neurosis, it's, uh, and, and then obedience becomes the, the universal virtue. Huh? Whereas no, when you see that the reason and the will combined function, mutually influencing one another, then we, we, uh, we are free as we move from intention, decision, sometimes deliberations, execution. Mm -hmm. And at every stage, there is a moment of creativity. We can really think what we're doing. We can really be inventive in this. We can decide. Huh? And, and sometimes people do not fail on the level of conscience. They know what is the value, but they fail then on the level of living it out. Huh? And so that's why we need the formation not only of the perception of the truth, but we need to form our interior being to be able to move from intention, sometimes deliberation if it's necessary, decision, and execution. And for this we need what we call the virtue of prudence, which gets you through all these stages. Unfortunately, in modern centuries, the word prudence started to mean caution. Mm. Well, that's, that's as if outside of, of action. Mm -hmm. No, we need to form this fundamental motor within us and also in the supernatural life to live out charity, we need to have the capacity to go from intention, decision to execution. And people have problems on different levels. Mm -hmm. Some people are very clear about what is to be done, but they don't do anything. Some people get stuck on the level of decision. They have doubts. Some people decide very well, but then the execution, they can't, they can't, they can't, do, it. They can't do it. So this is a, uh, freedom is a, is a program. It's a, it's a process and we grow in freedom as we grow in the virtues. Huh? You know, we're going to end this segment pretty quick, so we have about a minute, but 
You use the word formation, and especially philosophical, yeah. theological formation that we all, I think, that the culture needs. Yeah. Quickly, how does, that doesn't accidentally happen. How, well, what do you say to the person watching now who, who maybe doesn't experience that formation, but how can they do it? How do we, how do we form this, this, this freedom in our hearts? Well, we, by trying. You know, by, <laughs> practicing. Yeah, by practicing. <laughs> but also we need a clarification of the mind. We need a catechism, catechal teaching of the church. We need the word of God. We need to nourish our faith by the sacraments and so on. There are many elements which come into it. But we have to have the courage to do new things, to do things that we've never done. And if somebody says, oh, don't do it, it was never done before. Well, it will be done now. If you perceive the truth, the true, that this is the true good that is worth doing, do it. And we have to have the courage to do things we've never done before. And if we won't learn that, we will find the death difficult. Because to die, you have to do something that you've <laughs> never done before. <laughs> exactly. My dear brothers and sisters, uh, we have much more to talk about here. We're here with Father Wojciech Giertek. Of the, the of the papal household and uh, of Anglican University in Rome, Father, we look forward to the social implications of freedom, as yeah. as we'll talk about next. Uh, yeah. We'll be right back. Dear friends, welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. Once again, my name is Brother Angelus. I'm here with Father Innocent. We're so excited to join you this evening. Thank you for, for joining us and being so faithful every week. We want to welcome back to the show Father Wojciech Giertek. He is now the official theologian of Brother Angelus and Father Innocent. <laughs> <laughs> we need to stay close to him. But Father is the theologian of the papal household, a moral theolo the the theologian at uh, the Angelicum in Rome. And Father, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. This last segment is one I'm particularly interested in because... We want to get at the heart of, again, like we, we said in the, in the first segment, uh, we're in an election season here in, in America. And, you know, they just had the Brexit vote in, in, in you know, England mm -hmm. and, and talking about the European Union. I think people are confused, and I'm just saying this, and this is a lowly Franciscan seminarian. But there could be a confusion about the relationship between uh, the people and the state. And, and how freedom comes in and what kind of expectations we have from those in government, what kind of expectations we have from the law. And uh, I think we, we, we put our faith in there, we put our, the, the church in there, and there's kind of like this melting pot of confusion sometimes. And we expect something from the church or we expect something from the government that not, might not be at the root of our, our true human humanity. And so if you could speak a little bit to what really is going on in Europe today and the United States about the understanding of the relationship that we should have with those who are in government. Well, first of all, the church has a social ethics since apostolic times. It's not an invention of Leo the Thirteenth. <laughs> For centuries, the church has developed a social ethics trying to respond to social issues, of course, as they change. Now, the church has always defended what we call now the principle of subsidiarity, which means that what can be done on a lower level should not be done on a higher level. Now, I am under the influence of the writings of a Polish historian who wrote about civilizations. His name was Felix Konieczny, he was from Krakow. He died just after the Second World War. And he described this through the distinction between the public law and the private law. Now, the Catholic social ethics in medieval Europe consisted that the king had no right to infringe on uh, private law. Local entities, uh, corporations, universities, guilds of craftsmen, ethnic groups, religious orders, had their own laws. They functioned according to also uh, certain class structures, the nobility, gentry, they had their own rights, their own functioning. And the king could not encroach upon this. An English king could not enter the cottage of a peasant without the peasant's permission. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the public law had to respect the private law. Whereas in Byzantium, in the Byzantine Empire, there was the destruction of the private law and only the public law, with a heavy taxation, with a police state, uh, and which was constantly shrinking, and all the wealth was going to the capital, and the Muslims were advancing, uh, and basically the destruction of all grassroots initiatives. Now, in Europe, 
the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation was always from the Middle Ages eyeing Byzantium and hoping for something similar in Europe. And the struggle between the Holy Roman Empire and the papacy was a struggle between these two visions. And then ultimately in the period of the absolute, absolutist monarchies, including the Catholic monarchies, the Bourbons, the, the yes. Habsburgs, and even the Stuarts in England, they f followed the Byzantine model, and the Reformation followed it, certainly in Germany, of a church dependent on the state, uh, and a st centralized structure. And so this was always the dream of a united Europe with a centralized government, with a limited local initiatives, with a church dependent on the state, uh, and everything ruled from the center. And this is what we, what we have now in Europe. And whenever there's a crisis, they're saying more, more centralization. Whereas historically, the Puritans in England, who theologically were not Catholic uh, on the level of the ecclesiology, sacramentology, sure. they were distant from the church. But on the level of the social ethics, they were defending the Catholic principle of the independence of the local governments against the Stuarts. And then they went to America and set up your American system, which respects grassroots initiatives. And in America, you can establish a school from a nursery school up to university, deciding about the program, about the teaching, without government interference. Exactly. In Europe, it's impossible because education is the monopoly of the state. Mm -hmm. And if a group of women decide to arrange a nursery and take care of the kids while they're working, the local government intervenes, imposes the rules, the manuals that they have to use, the, and the taxation that they have to pay, and so on. So this is a, a, an excess of a public law to the detriment of the private law, whereas the Catholic perception is respect the local initiatives because they give the space for virtues. And when mm. you perceive there's a need, you set up a school, you set up a hospital, you set up a pension scheme, you set up a university without government interference. No. Whereas Europe also knows another model coming from Mongolia through Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and Turkey as well, huh? where there is no public law, there's only the private law of one individual. The Tsar, the Khan, <laughs> yeah, the that. Sultan, the Emperor. <coughs> so, uh, and this, I've seen this in Poland, and it has an impact also on the functioning of the church and religious orders also. The sort of attitude that those who are superiors, they impose their willpower, sheer willpower, and they want people who are submissive. Oh, yeah. And in Russia, people are submissive towards those who are above and brutal towards those who are below. Huh? And this is completely contrary to, to the Catholic, Catholic ethos. Huh? So you are lucky in America. You don't know. <laughs> we, we are lucky, and I, but I was just thinking that um, it, you made it real clear what the church's uh, teaching is on that. But it, it's, the United States is spe experiencing some struggle, though is because the, the, the government is getting bigger, right? Yeah. And, and we st we, they're, they're trying to tell, the, again, the church and uh, the, you know, the, you know, the religious liberty and all those, yeah. all those topics. Like the church, the, the, the government is kind of infringing on yeah, the freedom. Yeah, yeah. So what do you do? Well, we have the expansion, certainly uh, enormous expansion in the 20th century everywhere of government interference. And the government is taking responsibility every, for everything. It's a nanny state. Mm. Uh, it is. It's, uh, which generates a pacifism, a sense of entitlement that the government is to give and the taxpayers have to pay. So there's an enormous army of bureaucrats who are maintained by the taxpayers and they are infallible. They decide about everything. Now, religious liberty is not only the liberty of cult, uh, which is respected in Europe. You have the freedom to go to church and pray. It's not only the liberty of having religious convictions, which even the Chinese accept that you can have your personal religious convictions, but there's difficulty with the cult. But true religious liberty means you have the liberty to live your life according to the ethos that you uphold, both in your private life and in your public life. So you want the gospel values to be present in the schools, in the hospitals, in the local government, in the economy, in foreign policy, in the functioning sure. of the government. And this is true freedom, you know, that that as Christians, you can have an impact on this world. And if, if the church is reduced to the sacristy, you can pray, you can have your incense at the liturgy, you know, the, church, the state won't intervene, but no influence on in schooling because the, the government knows better. Huh? Well, this is, a, this is contrary to freedom. And this is contrary to certainly to Catholic social ethics. Father, what do we do? Um, and this, this just, oh, 
it was, it was on my heart as you were speaking, and I and I hope it doesn't take us off topic. But in 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 the church right now, and in, in in the election that we face, and I'm sure um, people experience it in Poland mm -hmm. and the other other places. But you take a step back, and we 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 have uh, a right to vote, but we also have a responsibility to be engaged mm -hmm. and involved. Numerous conversations in the past month, if you will, with um, of people who are discouraged but also don't know what to do. They they want to take a step back. They feel like they have no good option. And so people are talking about not voting. People are talking about writing in, which is in a way kind of a vote for, for one or the other. And you, or you have people saying it's the lesser of two evils, which is typically the conversation in American politics for the last couple decades. And so people aren't are in, in, in discouraged and they don't really know what to do. How do we help form them and, and help give them a sense of what, how are they really free and how can they exercise the freedom in the election? Well, I, I cannot give you a political advice for your election. Sure, of course, but not uh, look for that. social responsibility is not something that you do once every four years just by voting. You do it every day. Huh? And people who set up schools and maintain them, who set up free colleges, liberal arts colleges that you have here in America, people who are caring for their families, who are setting businesses, caring for the economy, giving work to people. This is a social responsibility that they're doing day by day. Huh? And so we must not view everything through the state which is to be the savior. Huh? The less the state is involved, the better, and then you can do, you can do more things. Now, of course, uh, uh, when you are faced, as you're saying, you know, the lesser of two evils, what are we to do? Well, it's good to remember in the Old Testament. Huh? In the Old Testament, <coughs> there was polygamy, there were wars, there were conflicts, there was a clan structure and so on. And yet God seeped in the covenant, uh, the, the relationship with, with chosen individuals who lived out the life of faith. Huh? And so we live in a world which is not ideal, and you're not choosing between two saints who will be your president. You're choosing between those who are, <laughs> who are available in the present situation. But it doesn't mean that everything will crash uh, in November sure. or for his time. You know. Whatever the situation is, you, know, you have to continue and live an authentic Christian life and and change the church from within. I remember under communism in Poland, where everything was decided in Moscow, and the, every, the government, the politics, the, the parliament, the media, everything was state controlled, following the rules from Moscow. And yet the church was present. Huh? And at Vatican II, when they were discussing how to put together the place of the church in the modern world, and the commissions that were working on this got stuck as they got stuck early on reflections on, on the moral order and they teared up a project, a constitution for the moral order which the council never approved. And in this moment when they were stuck, suddenly they got a response from Karol Wojtyla and a group of philosophers from, from Krakow who said the church is present in the world through the conscience of individuals and so view the moral order not from externally the church, God, the, more, the moral law, the state, kings, the constitution, but from the bottom, from the individuals who perceive the, the, the true good. And under communism, when we couldn't change the regime, but you had authentic Christians working in the schools, working in the hospitals, you know, being faithful to their conscience, and conscience is not a question of feelings, but a perception of the truth. The truth. It's an act of reason. And people who are, who are saying, no, we are doing the authentic, the, the, the true God. And in this way, communism was changed from, uh, from within, uh, yeah. by the change of hearts of individuals. Of course, this was with the spiritual help of, of God. And when John Paul II suddenly was elected Pope and he came to Poland, which suddenly appeared on television, a big mess, and he said, there's no aspect of our life where Christ has no right to enter. And people started clapping, and they clapped for 14 minutes mm -hmm. as an interval in his preaching. And this was a change of heart. And you prayed, may the Holy Spirit descend on the earth. And in the Polish, it means on, on the land. And he said, this land, you know, meaning yeah. this country. Yeah. And this was seen as the confirmation, as a sort of a sacrament of confirmation for the nation. Yeah. And this was the beginning of the social changes, which led to the crash of communism. And uh, so you live in difficult situations. They're not ideal. God hasn't put us in an ideal situation, but we need to be authentic, responsible to the truth from a personal interior liberty. And the more people are formed by this, the more there are mature people in society and more democracy can function.
And the problem in Islam is democracy cannot function because Islam doesn't form personalism. Well, I was just going to ask you that you have it on the notes here. Democracy can only function where there is personalism. Yeah. Can you speak, speak about that? Well, when the person is formed with the capacity to grow in virtues and in a personal responsibility. Whereas in Islam, we are just obedient or they're all flat mm -hmm. on the ground and there's no thinking within faith. There's no thinking within their religiosity. There's no formation of personal virtues. There are no autobiographies in Islamic culture. Huh? There's no question of assessing myself where I am. Whereas we Christians, in the light of the truth that we've received from God and we perceive also philosophically, we go for it with a personal responsibility. And to heck whether other people are following. I see this and I'm doing it. And the more we have mature people who go for the truth, huh? responsibly and it begins with family life you know deciding I form my family in a different way than other people there are some programs that we don't watch on television <laughs> there are some books that I won't give my children there are holidays which I organize as I want because there's a value system that I want for my kids this is a, a personal decision that people make which which is, is an expression of their responsibility and not just twiddle your thumbs and, and <laughs> await for the state to exactly. uh, to give you huh? So uh, I can conclude saying that happiness consists not in the gratification of desires, which is what the, uh, uh, the nanny state wants to say, that the state will give you all happiness and health care and everything and good holidays and take care of you uh, so that you're happy. You know, happiness consists in having more and more problems, always of a higher order. Mm. So the more you perceive challenges and respond to them and put your hands into them, and your time and your energy and your, your money and uh, you become more happy because there's more happiness in giving than in receiving. This is what Jesus told us. Amen. Amen. Father, before we conclude, we're just going to the last few minutes here. Uh, I was thinking about the year of mercy and we, we are currently in the year of mercy and, and it could be another source of, of confusion because not a lot of people know what mercy is, but also they, can, they compare it with justice. And, uh, you know, we just in the past couple of weeks here, we had numerous terrorist attacks, you know, local local attacks with going into, you know, schools and, and police stations and different things with, with shootings. And, and, you know, the police or the priest just a couple of days ago, you know, killed in, in France. And then people want justice, but they, they the culture has an understanding of justice and, and what they mean by that. And here we are not not saying we don't need justice, but. We, our understanding of justice is different and we, we see it in the light of, of who God is in, in his, his mercy and his love. Speak a little bit about the, the confusion and again, this, this tug of war between what our, the, our nation here, but, but also probably in Europe, this, this seeking and striving for justice, which does not necessarily really line up to, to our understanding of, of what mercy is and also what an authentic form of justice is. Well, justice without mercy is cruelty Whereas mercy without justice is confusion, huh? yeah. if, if it's without the truth. Huh? We need both. Huh? Now, my grandfather, before the First World War under the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, he was a judge and he would sentence people to prison. And my grandmother, his wife, was a member of the of a, 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 a association of St. Vincent de Paul and she would go to the prisons and distribute to the prisoners pictures of Jesus behind the, the, the yeah. grill of the prison oh, wow. and serve their devotion. So her husband was <laughs> sent to in the prison and she was caring for their spiritual life. We need both. And of course the state is to be concerned about, about justice, about the public order. And the state is entitled to use power. But the state has a brutal power. The state has a police truncheon and prison, even in, 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 in extreme cases, capital punishment. Huh? Whereas the church has other means. The church has the life of grace, the sacraments, the spiritual life. Huh? And when Peter pulled out the sword and wanted to defend Jesus with the sword, Jesus said, put the sword away. Huh? The church has the sword of the word of God which in the letter to Hebrews it said it's a double-edged sword which goes to the, to the joints of the body and soul. Huh? So as we are open to the grace of God huh, from within, huh, we can, uh, the, the, the gift that the church has transforms uh, life. 
whereas the state doesn't have this. So the state has to ensure an external uh, social order, and where there is greater chaos and greater confusion, the state may have greater powers to, 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 uh, to prevent uh, disorder. But the state can only lead to a certain level of a moral order, whereas the power of grace, the power of Christ, is much greater. Father, the last question, we, we have one minute. Uh, we, we have another show on EWTN called Icons, and it's based in the idea that there are people in the world that reveal Christ to us. Who have been icons or witnesses in, in your journey as a priest and as, as your time in Rome, people who have really been the face of Christ to you? I don't want to canonize anybody, anybody <laughs> but I hook on to what you say because Aquinas, in the opening lines of the Summa, quotes St. John Damascene, who was a great defender of icons in the Greek church when there was a conflict, what can icons be painted? And uh, the issue was, uh, is it possible to have something of the divinity on the wood? But it was also a Christological question tied with the heresy which denied the human will in Christ. And the Byzantine emperors preferred this heresy because it meant that Christ was a puppet in the hands of the Father, and so people have to be obedient to the, to, to the emperor. And Aquinas quotes him saying, uh, uh, quotes his line that the icon of God is visible in the person who has the intellect, the free choice, liberum arbitum, and per se potestativum, standing on his own feet. So people who are mature, also in the economics field, who are standing on their own feet, who are, sure. uh, this has always been the Catholic principle, the, the <coughs> more people are who are economically dependent, the better. So virtuous people who are good from within, they are icons of the icon. And this is the, the, the Christian morality, that we are to be icons of the icon that is Christ. Christ is the image of the invisible Father, and as we receive his grace, we become icons of the icon. And this is what St. Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians. And we with our unveiled faces, reflecting like mirrors the brightness of the Lord, all grow brighter and brighter as we are turned into the image that we reflect. This is the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit working within us elicits the icon of God on our faces. Father Gertek, thank you so much for being with us today. And we, okay. we just are so grateful for the opportunity to sit in your presence and, and to talk about the, the beauty of freedom. Father, if you would lead us in a prayer. My brothers and sisters, we're so grateful for the gift of this time with you. So grateful for the conversation. And may it continue to build fruit in your life, bear fruit, as we all try to live free lives uh, in Christ, always choosing Him and always seeking, uh, seeking true relationship with Him and our, ultimately our own salvation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this time together to come together as Catholics and, and faithful people to reflect on the gift of freedom, freedom in Christ and freedom in the church. We ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the grace to be, that is in our hearts from baptism to, be, to continue to set afire our souls, that we would be faithful witnesses to Christ in the world. We ask this through the intercession of Our Lady and all the angels and saints. And may Almighty God bless all of you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. My brothers and sisters, this kind of show couldn't happen without your support. Uh, Mother Angelica, Father Benedict, and Father Andrew are, are uh, wonderful servants. And uh, Mother Angelica used to always talk about the significance that, that evangelization through the power of media uh, is, is all of our work together. And so we really ask that if, it, if it's possible, if you could support uh, EWTN financially so this show can continue to go on and continue to influence the lives of so many people who desire to, to live their faith and, and be, be instruments of, of, of Christ's salvation in the world. Thank you so much. God bless you. Mm -hmm.